Good morning and thanks for tuning in. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Print Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines. Asian markets are off to a muted start amidst conflicting news flow over trade and macro data. Titan lowers its FY20 sales guidance for the jewellery business to 11 to 13 percent. The management had earlier guided for 20 percent growth. The Reserve Bank of India has increased the withdrawal limit of, uh, for customers of a PMC Bank to 50,000 rupees from the earlier 40,000 rupees. The government will not provide any relief to incumbent uh, telecom operators over collecting dues worth over 90,000 crore rupees as the industry is not under stress, according to a government official who spoke to Bloomberg. And Cipla, along with Tata Steel, will be the two nifty companies reporting their second quarter earnings today. Let's talk about the U.S. markets now. It was a flat day of trade for the U.S. markets. Both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq ended marginally lower, while uh, moderate gains were established uh, for the uh, Dow Jones industrial average. Well, here's a report by Ranita Young of Bloomberg News wrapping up Tuesday's Wall Street action. U.S. markets closed mixed on Tuesday, all as investors continue to assess the latest batch of corporate earnings results and the latest information on U.S.-China trade. Now, during the session, we saw a lot of commodities news. Milk futures rose to a five-year high, and this is welcome relief from America's farmers, which have seen a market glut and staggered prices for the past five years. We also saw crude oil jump for the third straight day, and the Bloomberg dollar spot index was higher, but gold was a little bit lower and it's no surprise there since there still was quite a bit of risk in the market within companies we saw Xerox rising after agreeing to sell its 25% stake in Fuji Xerox to Fujifilm for 2.3 billion dollars Fujifilm will own 100% of the company McDonald's recovered some of those losses that came on Monday after the CEO was fired for having a consensual relationship with an employee and Marriott International cut its full year adjusted EBITDA view and missed analyst expectations. Next up for earnings will be Frontier Communications, Davida, and Caesars Entertainment. And that's a look at your Wall Street action on Tuesday in New York. I'm Renita Young for Bloomberg News. All right, let's uh, also take a look at the Asia Pacific region. I'm joined by Sophie Kamruddin uh, from uh, the Hong Kong studios. Morning, Sophie. Seems like the U.S. markets were treading water yesterday. Are we looking at the start at, uh, in Asia? Well, this Wednesday, Asian shares are mixed, moving to the downside after a four-day gain amid signs of overheating for global equities, while bonds are mostly lower. We have Treasuries holding that overnight drop after the yield curve bear steepened. Aussie yields climbing ahead of a 2030 sale from down under. And JGBs are falling as bond bulls are nervous ahead of a 10-year auction. Now, Japan's 10-year yield has risen to a June high. Now, stocks in Tokyo are fluctuating, with the topics briefly topping 1,700 earlier for the first time since October 2018. And the Hang Seng is looking to halt a four-day gain lower by two-tenths of a percent, while Chinese stocks have also opened to the downside. The CSI 300 uh, is trading flat for the moment after breaking 4,000 for the first time since April on Tuesday. And the offshore UN has strengthened back below the seven handle after a stronger fixing from the PBOC. Analysts, though, warned that the strength is temporary. I also want to highlight the Thai bot, which is slipping from a six-year high ahead of an anticipated rate cut from Thailand as the central bank there attempts to curb the currency strength. And the Kiwi dollar is under pressure as a bigger than forecast rise in the jobless rate in New Zealand stirs speculation for the RBNZ to cut rates again next week. Back to you. Thanks so much for that, Sophie. All right. Now, one of the big talking points over the last uh, weeks and months has been the U.S.-China trade talks. And as a development from that, China is setting its price for any interim trade deal or even a phase one of a possible trade deal with the United States. Beijing has asked the U.S. administration to roll back all duties imposed in September and also to withdraw any threat of a possible new tariffs. The question now is whether Donald Trump will agree to those conditions. Tom McKenzie of Bloomberg News has more. 
Well, certainly not surprising that the tariffs are a core issue. They've made that point repeatedly over the last few months. But we do have some clarity on what that exactly means for the Chinese side. So three key points, really. They want those threatened tariffs currently penciled into the calendar for December the 15th taken off the table. They also want the $150 or $110 billion worth of tariffs that were imposed in September cut as well completely, those duties. And then we know that the U.S. and Chinese sides are also mulling and discussing whether or not to reduce the level of tariffs on $250. $50 billion worth of Chinese goods were imposed back in 2018. From the Chinese perspective, it's a question of equivalence, because if they're going to send their president over to the U.S. to sign a deal, which, of course, we've reported on as a possibility, in a, if they're going to give away some of their leverage in terms of ag purchases and intellectual property, then they want to get some of this tariff relief from the U.S. in return. And as you say, though, the key question is whether or not Trump will take this seriously, whether he'll consider this, whether he'll agree to cutting tariffs at this stage. Yeah, he's very proud to be tariff man. So what are the political risks for him? So the political risks are not insignificant. You've both got the Democrats and the Republicans, a bipartisan push to get a solid, a concrete and an enforceable deal against China. And part of that for many of those lawmakers is keeping the tariffs in place to ensure that China does live up to its side of the deal. But of course you have the economic impact and you have concern from the business and corporate lobby in the US about to what extent the tariffs are dragging down growth. You've seen that reflected in the latest trade numbers, for example where imports of goods to the U.S. dropped 5 percent from China and exports from the U.S. to China dropped 10 percent in the month of September. So it's a push and a play out and a struggle, a tug of war between both the economic concerns, of course, the short and medium term economic concerns and those political concerns for President Trump. All right, let's uh, also take a look at what's making headlines across the globe. Ritika Gupta of Bloomberg News brings you the first word headlines. Dallas Fed boss Robert Kaplan has told Bloomberg he's comfortable with the recent steepening of the yield curve, saying it's a sign that overall Fed policy is in the right place. He has voiced concern in the past that having the Fed's benchmark policy rate above the entire Treasury yield curve was a warning that it had set rates too high. However, he now says rates appear to be, quote, appropriate. A senior Trump administration envoy has testified that the White House did pressure Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden in exchange for an Oval Office meeting for the country's new president. The U.S. ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sondland, contradicted President Trump's repeated assertion that there was no quid pro quo. Sondland said he believed the investigation would have, ha have to happen before Volodymyr Zelensky could meet President Trump. A veteran of the shale oil industry say the relentless boom in U.S. production is coming to an end. Pioneer Natural Resources CEO Scott Sheffield says calls for producers to shutter rigs and stop burning cash are being heeded, with output growth across the U.S. slowing next year. His comments come as OPEC says the outlook for oil in 2020 is brightening as the global economy holds up. Police used water cannon Tuesday night to break up crowds of masked anti-government protesters in Hong Kong who had gathered in the busy shopping district of TST. Some had set barricades blocking traffic and vandalized shops they considered to be pro-China. The protesters wore masks of the anarchist comic book character V for Vendetta to mark one month, to mark the month since the government ban on face coverings. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. All right. Uh, well, let's turn to the Indian markets now. Agam Vakil is here to set you up for the day's trade and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space. Agam, at the start yesterday, we, we were talking about consolidation, possibly people taking some money off the table, having made gains over the last seven sessions or so. Yeah. Uh, that happened, and we're likely to see some more of that today. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, we didn't watch in that one. But a lot of stocks out there, Alex, which showed were some very sharp moves for mm. the gains as well as, you know, losses. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to stick to the index at least for the time being. And, uh, well, we are looking at perhaps a little bit of 
uh, more of a decline, as Alex was just mentioning. Uh, well, so that's as far as the SX is concerned, down around 0.2%. Uh, we did see the indices come off, snapping a seven-day gaining streak, so the Nifty down two-tenths of a percent. More weakness in the broader markets, as indicated by the mid-cap and small-cap indices, with the banking indices, too, showing weakness. How are ADRs performing right now? Well, a mixed picture, certainly, but we don't really have sharp moves. If you can go on to this next set of the ADRs, too, we only have Dr. Reddy's, which stands out with a gain of around 2.3%. But moving on, uh, you know, as far as the fund flows are concerned, well, we've actually seen uh, buying return to FIs uh, and, um, you know, from FIs, and that's to the tune of around 473 odd crores. GIs, on the other hand, selling, uh, well, nearly 1,600 crores odd worth. But moving on, let's also talk about uh, your contributors. So we had gains, and some very sharp gains, essentially, in Bajaj Finance in the last half an hour. SPI, ITC, and Bharti Atal, well, providing some support, some weakness coming in Infosys, Reliance Industries, and Kotak Mandra Bank. But what about futures and options? Let's take a look at that as well. The Nifty futures saw an addition of 2.5% increase in open interest. The Nifty banking futures also saw 5% increase in open interest, potentially towards uh, shorts. Well, we're not certain yet as to which direction it is because the move on the indices is not substantial. But what about options? Uh, well, uh, at this point in time, your Open interest uh, is between 11,600 put and uh, the 12,000 call. That's the very the maximum open interest is. What about change in open interest? Uh, well, we have seen a little more writing around 12,200, 12,300 calls. On expected lines, of course, considering the Nifty came off to a certain extent. The India Wix is flat around 15.9, and the Nifty put call ratio hasn't. Well, actually, has has come off to around 1.34 versus 1.4. And in terms of stocks, keeping an eye on Bharat Electronics, Canada Bank, Coal India. Uh, all of them have seen a surge in open interest, and among uh, those stocks which are seeing unwinding, Z, SRF, Kerala Healthcare, and JSPL. So a bunch of stocks out there, and again, it'll be all about uh, you know earnings, Alex. We're expecting uh, Titan to at least see a little bit of a knock today, mm. and uh, Tech Mahindra, on the other hand, could very well open in the green. And we're going to talk about that in more detail in just a yeah. short while. Thanks so much for that, Agam. All right. Now, India, as you know, if you've been following, Bloomberg Quint opted out of the Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, or RCEP, trade agreement in order to protect, protect and safeguard uh, its domestic industry. At least that's the word coming in from Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal. Addressing a press conference, Goyal said that India is open to talks in the future, provided that its demands are met by member nations. Listen in. भारत लगातार अंदर कमरे के अंदर चर्चा में नेगोशिएशंस में अपने इट स्टूड इट्स ग्राउंड जो जो अपनी रिक्वायरमेंट्स थी जो जो हमारे मांगे थी उसको हम लेके खड़े रहे हमारी मांगों में मुख्यतः जो ट्रेड डेफिसिट है जिस प्रकार से आयात ज्यादा है निर्यात के बदौलत उसको कैसे संतुलन लाना कैसे हमारे भारत के उद्योग को प्रोटेक्शन मिले इनडिस्क्रिमिनेट इंपोर्ट या सर्ज इन इंपोर्ट से कैसे अनफेयर इंपोर्ट्स जो नॉन टैरिफ बैरियर्स के माध्यम से लोग हमारे प्रोडक्ट्स को तो बाहर जाने नहीं देते हैं लेकिन उनके प्रोडक्ट्स भारत में आते हैं उस पर भारत कैसे सख्त कदम उठा सके और भारत के जो सामान है भारत के जो सर्विसेज हैं गुड सर्विसेज उसके लिए विदेश में भी अच्छे मौके मिले अच्छे अपॉर्चुनिटीज मिले इन सब विषयों को लेके भारत लगातार चर्चा में अपनी बात रखता रहा लगभग हमारी कई सारी मांगों में हमने सफलता पाई बहुत सारी हमारी मांगे मंजूर भी हुई लेकिन अंत में जब हमने बैलेंस में देखा कि पूर्णतः आर को जब हम देखते हैं तो हमें लगा कि भारत को इसके साथ नहीं जुड़ना चाहिए All right, changes in the Foreign Exchange Management Act rules have apparently made it tougher for foreign-owned mutual funds to operate in India. To talk about this a little bit more, I'm joined on the phone line by Paiswini Upadhyay. Uh, Paiswini, uh, just to understand what are these changes to begin with and how are they negatively impacting these mutual funds? Hi, Alex. Good morning. Yeah, morning. Uh, so let me uh, start by laying out what the changes uh, are. 
so FEMA, um, which was the new FEMA regulations, which were uh, notified in August uh, on October 17, they have changed the definition of investment vehicle. So, which earlier included uh, uh, your entities like AIFs, REITs, or INVIS, will now also include mutual funds, which invest more than 50% in equity. Uh, this more than 50% in equity has its own complications. I'll come to that in a bit. But now, to start with, investment vehicles will include mutual funds. Uh, now, once you qualify as an uh, you know, investment vehicle, which is foreign-owned, any investment that you do in India then gets categorized as an indirect foreign investment. The moment your investment gets categorized as an indirect foreign investment, there are a bunch of FDI restrictions or foreign direct investment restrictions that come into play, uh, which is to do with your sectoral caps, uh, your entry routes, your pricing guidelines, your reporting requirements, etc. Now, lastly, uh, what the new FEMA regs also say that if this uh, sponsor and investment manager of the mutual fund in India is not organized as a company or an LLP, so the another structure can be a trust structure, SEBI will be able to determine if such a sponsor qualifies as foreign owned. So for a, a very basic example, I'm just taking names, uh, and this is not to be taken as a structure that currently exists today, uh, if Mere Asset Management sponsor is uh, organized as a trust outside of India, then SEBI will have discretion to basically assess whether or not Mire Asset uh, Management in India uh, will qualify as an entity which is foreign-owned. Now, uh, the impact of all of this is that uh, a bunch of your EMCs which are foreign-owned, which have sponsors uh, outside of India, so your likes of Franklin, HBC, Mire, BNP Paribas, ICICI, HDFC, uh, they, their investments uh, sort of now um, are facing a FEMA scrutiny. Uh, so this is a distinction now for the first time that FEMA has made between domestic mutual funds and foreign-owned mutual funds. Um, and as a result of this disti distinction, what will happen is that uh, the investments by these foreign-owned mutual funds will be subject to FDI restrictions, uh, and the domestic mutual funds, uh, in a conventional sense, uh, will not come or uh, will not be sort of covered under FDI. Mm. Now, I, what will also mm. happen is that uh, once the uh, investments by these foreign-owned mutual funds uh, come into sort of the FEMA umbrella, uh, every time now these mutual funds make an investment uh, in a sector, uh, they will have to check that in a particular stock, what is the FDI limit, what is the sectoral limit, has the foreign investment limit in that stock been breached or not. Uh, they will have to comply with the RBI reporting requirements on that. So once your investment qualifies as an FDI or an indirect foreign direct investment, a bunch of complications come into play, which is what these uh, mutual funds uh, now are representing before SEBI, I believe, um, to say that why are you discriminating, uh, uh, you know, just because our sponsor is foreign-owned and uh, the money is very well domestic. Mm. Understood. Uh, thanks so much for explaining that, uh, Paiswani. Uh, we'll bring you updates as and when we get them in terms of whether or not those representations uh, have any uh, impact in terms of changes made to the FEMA regulations. That's how it stands as of now, though. But uh, let's turn to earnings for now. By the way, if you want to have a look at that story, it's available on the website BloombergQuint.com in case you want to read it in more detail. For now, let's turn to earnings. Tech Mahindra, Agam was talking about it, uh, and he's back to talk about it a little more because the second quarter bottom line rose 17%, surpassing analyst estimates. Margins, uh, too, saw an expansion. Uh, Tech Mahindra CFO uh, Ma Manoj Bhatt, uh, expects the company's margins to normalize by FY21. He said this in a conversation with Agam. Uh, listen to just a portion of that conversation. We have had a very satisfying quarter. I think if I look at the highlights, uh, I think it's a record de quarter of deal wins for us, about one and a half billion or so in terms of deal wins. Uh, the second thing is if I look at the growth in digital revenue, I think we are hitting 39% of revenues. So again, uh, the momentum continues in, in that aspect. And third is, of course, uh, we continue to add to our capability set. We just uh, uh, announced uh, uh, the 
signing of an agreement with the bond group uh, which is a e-commerce uh, and uh, digital strategy firm which we announced this quarter uh, i think coming to the numbers i think clearly uh, good all round growth across verticals uh, the only vertical i think where uh, uh, as we had indicated uh, there's a cer certain slowness in the auto segment but apart from that it, it's been very good all round growth even if i look at a geography cut on a constant currency basis we grew across all uh, uh, parts of the globe in terms of our operations uh, during the quarter of course uh, europe for example saw, saw some cross currency headwinds but adjusting for that i think there's been good amount of growth so if i look at uh, the quarter from that perspective uh, it's in line with uh, what we were thinking in terms of uh, a strong funnel being converted and that is resulting into revenue growth and that's something which we expect that that will continue going into the future also. Okay, great. That's good to know, Manoj. Uh, well, if you could also tell us about uh, operating margins. Now, there were all sorts of guesses that there could be some amount of pressure uh, in on margins given the kind of investments that the company may have to take up. Uh, that's not clearly come through, uh, and well, we've seen an expansion in operating margins. So, firstly, if you could tell us and perhaps quantify all the factors that worked for and worked against uh, margins for Tech Mahindra. And you know, perhaps if you could also give us an idea about in future, could there be more investments in store based on the kind of deals that you guys have signed that could lead to well, some pressure as far as operating margins go? So if I look at operating margins from Q2, uh, in Q2 compared to Q1, of course, uh, we have had some efficiencies come through, which is about 100 bips uh, positive side on the margins. We've also had visa costs, which is usually in Q1, that is absent in Q2. I think those are the two main positive levers. Uh, I think the on the other side, we have had a little bit of uh, a small portion of employees who uh, who are on the quarter two salary hike cycle. So there's been some small impact of that. But if I look at uh, going forward, I think uh, while we'll continue to work on two or three main margin levers, one is of course synergy with portfolio companies that remains a big element of uh, something we are trying to do on a continuous basis. The second is uh, usage of automation, not only for internal operations, but also for client engagements. And last but not the least, I think in terms of our uh, uh, overall operational and sg and a cost and how we continue to focus on uh, bringing that down in, in line with uh, our objectives of continuous improvement across all parts of operations. Uh, but on the other side, as I look at the next two quarters, uh, we are going to go in execution mode in some of the uh, recent deal wins and there is an associated uh, cost of uh, actually transforming, transitioning which will impact margins on the on in the next two quarters. So if I look at probably normalizing that, I think uh, that, that normalization will happen in FY21. In FY20, uh, I think we will see the just the share momentum of large deals is going to depress margins uh, as over the next two quarters. All right, the earnings and the outlook uh, for Tech Mahindra are going forward. Let's turn to Titan now. It reported a subdued growth in the second quarter, uh, and the jewelry arm, its uh, biggest revenue contributor, not only saw a decline in sales in the uh, July to September period, the company also cut the guidance uh, for the segment for the full financial year. Agam Akil is here with a closer look, look at the numbers. Agam, first the headline numbers, and then, of course, the outlook might just be troubling for a few people. Uh, yes, absolutely, Alex. It's certainly a disappointing quarter for Titan Company, especially when uh, well there, there were a lot of uh, well hopes for you know strength on the back of festive season. Uh, that said, in terms of headline numbers, we've seen an overall growth of just less than one percent. Your EBITDA has moved up 10 percent. Margins did expand by around 100 basis points to 11.6, but uh, net profits were up only two percent. But you know the real well, miss and disappointment is not on the bottom line. It is on the outlook of the jewelry sales segment. Now, we already know, and as the company had already indicated in the quarterly update, that there will be a decline uh, as far as the jewelry sales are concerned for this particular quarter year on year. However, when it comes to the outlook for the second half 
of this financial year. That outlook in terms of growth has been cut from 20% earlier, which was indicated in the first quarter, to as much as 11 to 13% now. And that is going to be a big disappointment, perhaps. That's also the reason why a lot of brokerages have cut price targets on Titan. Watches, uh, we again, we already know, did see about 6.5% uh, well, growth. And eyewear, which is a very small segment yet, did see about a 33% growth, but on the whole, it's larger segment, jewelry segment, which has been facing a lot of pressure, not only on the account of the consumer slowdown, but also because of higher gold prices that have kept customers at bay is the reason why the, the, the company has cut its outlook as far as uh, the growth is concerned. And we're expecting some sort of, uh, well, uh, you know, pressure as far as its stock is concerned today. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Uh, clearly, uh, Tech Mahindra and Titan, key companies to watch out for in trade today. Let's stick with earnings, though. It's likely to be a subdued quarter for Sipla on the, both the top line and bottom line front. Margins may expand, while India and other emerging market businesses are likely to see a strong sequential growth. To tell you all about that, I'm joined by Darshan Mehta. Good morning, Darshan. What are the key expectations going in? Yeah, Alex, so uh, basically uh, you said uh, that the growth will come in in India and that was on account of uh, the lot of one-offs that happened in the first quarter. Now, basically 4% top-line growth on a year-on-year -year basis is something that we're seeing. 7% uh, bottom-line growth and EBITDA margin expansion to 19.5% versus 17.8%. Now, individually on the geography front, uh, India will grow both on a year-on-year -year basis as well as a quarterly basis and more on a quarterly basis given the fact that last in the first quarter, there were a lot of trade disruptions that happened and money will flow in into this quarter. Uh, South Africa, we are seeing that quarter on quarter will be weak. North America also quarter on quarter will be weak because of a key drug called Sensipar. Apart from it, I'll talk about that. Uh, Europe will be strong, uh, both growth that will come in and emerging markets over last year will be weak, but uh, over quarter on quarter, it will be strong. The US sales trend is expected to be much st stronger, this time, uh, much lower this time around because of a lack of uh, Sensipar, which is one of the key drugs that is there. Uh, so that is about, uh, we, we we are expecting. Uh, uh, the trend that we are seeing, what ex exactly are we are expecting? Uh, disruption in uh, the key uh, trade uh, uh, to generics impacted the India business in the last quarter. That is expected to come in this time around. Uh, Sensipar is one of the key drugs that they had. Now it's off exclusivity. So revenues and because of price competition and price erosion, there will be competition there. Uh, the South Africa business will be lower because the tenders were, uh, uh, you know, renegotiated at a much lower prices. Uh, deferral of the revenues from the first quarter will probably aid the, if, aid the emerging market business and Sensipar will drive the margins for the company this time around. Darshan, there's also Lupin to talk about. Uh, what are the factors to watch there? So we are seeing an 11% top line growth and an 11% profit growth that is there. EBITDA will be much stronger at 40% uh, growth. So EBITDA margins we are seeing at close to 18%. Uh, basically, that will be led by uh, the formulation business, which will see a double digit growth over last year, while the API business will see modest uh, 5 to 7% growth uh, this time around. Uh, now on, on that, North America will be up 12% over last year. India will be up 15%. 15% over last year. Japan and other markets will be stable on a year-on-year -year basis, while India, North America may see a downtick on a, on a sequential basis. Uh, what will if affect and why is this U.S. sales down? Uh, lack or lo loss of Renexa exclusivity is something that will impact the sequential numbers and slow ramp up in the U.S. And that is why we are seeing a weakness on the American market. Uh, domestic data was very strong, so India is expected to be strong. And there will be a one-off, one-time uh, one licensing fee uh, uh, from BI this time around, uh, that probably will aid uh, the profits for the company. All right, thanks so much for that, Darshan. Sticking with earnings, but moving to another se sector, um, Tata Steel is expected to report a sharp contraction in profit in the September quarter. <laughs> Lower volumes and realizations are likely to have hurt the numbers. Nikki Machandani has this report. Well, lower volume, inventory build-up and the pricing power, all of this is going to be weighing down on the earning of Tata Steel on a consolidated basis. The number that we're working with, we're expecting a degrowth of as much as a 21% on the top-line front for the company on a consolidated basis. Uh, in terms of the operational performance, we're expecting a more than 52% uh, decline out there. Margins for that matter, just on the face of it, we're expecting a contraction to 12.4% as compared to nearly 21 
20% in the corresponding quarter of the previous year and profitability that to shrinking it's seen shrinking by as much as 87% to a number of roughly 460 odd crore as compared to 3600 crore in the corresponding quarter well volumes have already been reported by the company and on consolidated basis uh, uh, for this uh, quarter we saw a 3% nearly 3% decline there and India business as we all know it's a 4.2% uh, downtick there inventory build up along with lower auto volumes have impacted uh, the steel India business along with that in terms of European business that has to remain flattish year on year basis for this quarter and the Southeast Asian business where the volumes are down as much as 6.5% uh, in terms of key other parameters or rather how the operational breakup will uh, pan out for the company as a whole uh, on standalone basis uh, we are expecting a 45% downtick in uh, the EBITDA performance of the company Bush and Steel that has already reported the numbers we have seen the lower realization actually impacting the uh, the, the operational performance by as much as 56% year on year basis European business this time around that unit is expected to make loss of a 22 crore as compared to a profit that we saw in the corresponding quarter essentially on account of lower spreads that we have seen uh, and the weak demand condition out there in that particular division or that geography uh, Southeast Asian business there also we expecting an EBITDA loss there nine and a half crore versus a profit figure of nearly 112 odd crore net net we're not looking at good set of numbers coming in from Tara Steel because realization are expected to be lower on account of slow on account of lower HRC prices and apart from that it's also the inventory buildup which is expected to weigh down coking coal benefits will be partially seen in this quarter but much of it would be factored in or would be coming through in the next quarter three things that we like to keep our eye out will be the inventory buildup export volume share and the auto demand commentary all right, with that, let's turn to the stocks that you have to watch out for in trade today. We've spoken about several, but Somit Sarkar is joining me to tell you about several more. Good morning, Somit. What's on your list? Good morning, Alex. I'll start off with the earnings in the steel and power. The results were largely in line with analyst estimates. The margins were aided by strong domestic steel business and the power business. The international business performance was weak and higher realizations and reduction in net debt were the key positives in the earnings. Ajinta Pharma results were again largely in line with analyst estimates. The profits were impacted because of higher depreciation and finance costs, but the margins were lower due to higher raw material costs. The India sales were up 13%, while exports were higher by 27% compared to last year. Gujarat Gas, again, results were largely in line with analyst estimates, the volumes stood 38% higher compared to last year, close to 9.3 million metric standard cubic meter per day because of more contribution coming in from the Morbi region. The management also said that they see more volume potential from the Morbi region and they are seeing an average of around 9.5 mm SCMD of gas levels in the, for the second half of financial year 2020. DV's laboratories, the results were largely in line. The revenue growth was aided by a couple of segments. The net profit was dropped due to lower other income and higher expenses as while well, the higher raw material cost also impacted the margins of the company. Torrent Power, the results were largely in line with analyst estimates and revenue growth was aided by new power purchase agreements and higher merchant power sale while the net profit surged due to a deferred tax reversal. However, the company's margins were lower due to higher fuel costs. In other stocks to watch, firstly HCL because they had their uh, investor meet yesterday and the management said that, they are optimist that management gave their optimistic growth outlook in the digital and the software businesses. Along with this, the management also gave a detailed strategic growth roadmap after the recent launch of HCL software. They also said that the product acquisition will come to a pause as the IBM integration is rolling out and the management also said that they are hoping to maintain the revenue momentum through various innovations. Hindalco, because a uh, they are supposed to acquire Alaris and that Alaris has reported a strong performance in this quarter. Now, Alaris has saw a, saw a strong growth both in automotive and uh, aerospace segment. The adjusted EBITDA pattern was the highest ever in the company's history. Also, the stock will remain in focus because Novelis, which is its uh, subsidiary, that is Hindal's core subsidiary, will be announcing its earnings today. Along with this, PI Industries, because the arm will be buying nearly 100% stake in Isagro Agrochemicals for nearly 345 crore. And lastly, CG Power and Industrial Solutions where they have backed a 24 million US dollars order from Indonesian state utility uh, for power transformers. Thanks so much for that, uh, Somit. All right, let's uh, talk about the banking space and specifically about ICICI Bank. It's decided to shut down its project finance a vertical as economic conditions have turned unfavorable according to the bank. ICICI Bank incidentally started off as an infrastructure pro project financier before evolving into a full-fledged bank. So why did it take such a step? Vishwanath Nair reports. 
after decades of pioneering the business and literally teaching everyone how to do it, uh, ICICI Bank has decided to shutter down uh, its project finance vertical. Uh, now this comes uh, on the back of a prolonged period of economic slowdown that India is facing and especially ICICI Bank which has been bearing the brunt of it. Uh, ICICI Bank became a, uh, became a bank only in 1994. Uh, prior to that it was originally established as a, a development financial institution which essentially means a company that funds long-term infrastructure projects in the country. Uh, now that it has decided to shut down the project finance vertical, uh, this business will move into the broader corporate banking uh, and corporate financing business, uh, while uh, ICICI Bank will continue to maintain its current existing policy of only engaging with uh, well-rated and high-tier corporates, uh, which, are going to put up, uh, uh, which are going to put up any kind of infrastructure project in India. Uh, remember that already the demand for uh, putting up an infrastructure project as well as demand for infrastructure loans uh, has been coming down significantly. Uh, ICICI Bank also has a policy of reducing uh, its uh, large uh, concentration risk, uh, which it has been doing since 2016 consecutively. Uh, it has been bringing down uh, the, the amount of loan it has given out to its top 10 and top 20 borrowers uh, and thereby bringing, uh, b rebalancing its book in favor of more retail loans. Uh, this, this move to shutter uh, the uh, project finance vertical or the dedicated project finance vertical uh, is considered by many as a sad and disappointing move uh, because ICICI Bank's original identity is with infrastructure lending and without that uh, it, it begs the question as to who exactly is going to fund these infrastructure projects which are going to come up in India in the next few years. Well, uh that's the question that a lot of people are searching for answers to. Meanwhile, there's a lot more that will come up over the course of the day, so do stay tuned. This, as you know, is Bloomberg Quint.